Father, again, we come before you to thank and give you praise for the Son you have given, for the Spirit you have bestowed upon us. We thank you, Lord, for the congregation that gathers here in your name today, and we pray that your blessings might rest upon us. We need you, Lord. We want you in our lives. We want your direction, and we pray that your Spirit and your Word would guide us And may we be responsive. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of living in a nation in which we share so many freedoms that are not known in other places in our world. We pray, Lord, that you might guide the hearts and minds of those who 
are in leadership positions, places of authority. We pray that they might be sensitive to your guidance and your direction. We ask these things in your name. Amen. We're going to be looking and finishing our uh, series of messages from the Epistle to Titus today. We're going to be looking at chapter 3 for our text. As we think about healthy churches are prepared or ready for and devoted to doing what is good. Healthy churches are prepared for and devoted to doing what is good. Let's read the third chapter. And I hope you have your, um, I hope you have your uh, quick ears listening on because we're going to run through this uh, and won't keep you past the dinner hour, all right? Titus chapter 3. Paul says, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility toward all men. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Now, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn him a second time. And after that, have nothing to do with him. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. As soon as I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, because I've decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order that they may provide for daily necessities and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Paul must have been a, he must have been a Southerner, right? Grace be with y'all. Notice that Paul is, he's telling, he's, he's directing t Titus how to help the newly born and established churches all across the island of Crete to become healthy. And of course, he he's already told us that they need godly leaders to be healthy. And so... Select godly leaders. He's told us that there's, there's some things going on because of the nature of the world in which you're living in. There's, there's times you're going to need to silence those who are leading you astray. Those who are false teachers. And one of the things that I believe that the church as a whole, not only in America, but all around the world, the church as a whole has failed greatly in is what he brings up in chapter 2 where he talks about how we need to mentor we need to teach not only what's in accord but we need to demonstrate that men need to demonstrate it to the younger men women need to demonstrate it to younger women and demonstrate how God's grace works and operates in our lives. You just not, you're not just kind of showing them something, you know, like you, know, you would in a play or something, but your whole life becomes the play 
the stage that they observe these doctrines lived out and followed consistently. And then in chapter 3, he says, I want to remind you to remind these folks of some very important things. And he says, remind the people, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be respectful of them, of their person and of their position. And you know, if we aren't careful, we can, because our, our leaders, even in America today, believe it or not, our leaders don't always agree with not only our political position, but with our moral stands. They don't always agree and follow those things. But you know, Nebuchadnezzar didn't agree with them either. But Daniel and those three Hebrew children convinced him by how they lived and conducted themselves in a godly way. And one of the greatest needs in our community and in our nation is for Christian people to be Christian in their behavior. I remember as we were coming from Antlers, Oklahoma some time ago, we came through, I mean, we were coming through the mountains. I don't know if you, how familiar you are with Oklahoma, but, but Oklahoma has some pretty good hills in some parts of it. And we were coming through that area and there was a little, little Baptist church sitting there in a little community out in nowhere. And on its sign, what kind of vitamin is a Christian? Should a Christian be? B1. B1. Vitamin B1. And so, Paul is telling us, not just the church in Corinth, but he's sharing with us because God's Holy Spirit gave him this message to give for generations to come. And he's telling us that we need to be careful and remind one another to be respectful and to be obedient. That is not rebellious, but obedient. Uh, when, when the Jews were taken into captivity, and Jer- they were going to be taken into captivity, and Jeremiah had prophesied that this was going to happen. And God spoke to Jeremiah and he told him to give this message to the people once they were in the land of captivity. In Jeremiah 29 and 7, it says, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Now listen to this. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. You too will prosper. Pray for it. That's a good reason to be praying for our nation, isn't it? If we want to be, do well, And especially if we want to be able to as freely share the gospel of Christ without fear of going to jail or being beaten up or whatever, having things confiscated, like sometimes in church history they are. And in fact, in certain places today they are. Um, we, We need to abide by this directive. Seek peace and prosperity of the city which you have, I've carried you into. Pray to the Lord for it. And time and again in this passage that we just read, we notice he says, be ready to do whatever is good. I believe if we're going to be ready, then we must be involved. We must be involved. We can't just sit on the sidelines and think, for example, that our nation is going to turn around. It's not going to happen. We're going to have to be ready, be prepared. That's what that word ready means. Be prepared for doing what is good. And then he goes on to say, remind them to slander no one. To slander no one. You know, one of the ways which slander often occurs is through gossip. 
That's through gossip. I have to appreciate my dad because my dad, I, I never did hear him say anything negative, demeaning about anyone. That's not that he disagree, didn't disagree with others and he would express what he believed. But he didn't belittle anybody. He was careful. I never heard him carry a tail. Never heard him slander no one. And then he says, remind them to be peace, peaceable. And I like this. I looked uh, some of these words up. Uh, I'm not, even though I've had some Greek. Um, as one fellow said, I, I knew a little Greek, but he moved off. <laughs> but I, I have had some Greek, but I looked this word up, this word peaceable. And do you know it's from amato, a Greek term amacho. And that is the, the A, by the way, makes it negative. Okay. Most of you have heard of macho. Macho. And he says, don't be macho. In other words, don't be easily offended. Don't try to prove that no one can shove you around. Why? Well, because that's not, where the, that's not where the emphasis should be. What that does is put the emphasis on me or upon you. And our emphasis is not to be upon us. It's to be upon Him. And when we are being macho, we're not being what God has called us to be. Just think of if Jesus had been macho. You know what the Bible says? In Philippians chapter 2 it says, And He humbled Himself. He didn't become macho. He already was powerful. But He humbled Himself. Remind them to be considerate. That word is sometimes translated in the Scriptures. In fact, often it's translated gentle. Gentle. Or meek. How many of you have ever ridden a horse? Ever ridden a horse? Yeah. Have you ever tried to ride a horse just holding on to the mane with no bridle or anything? Yeah, yeah. That's not the easiest thing to do, is it? Now, if you put a bridle on that horse and you put the bits in its mouth, is that horse any less powerful? No. But the power is brought under control. God isn't asking us to be weaklings. No, no. He's just telling us that we need to make sure that we have our power under control. The control of His Spirit. The guidance and direction of His Word. And so He's saying, remind them to be gentle. Have their power under control. Don't be explosive. Don't be a hothead. And show true humility to all men. And then after he gives this direction, he begins there in verse 3 to tell, us, tell them to remember how we once were. And remember, he doesn't say how you once were, how they once were. He says how we once were. Paul's including himself. This is, I was like this too. Remember how we once were. At one time, we too were under the control of a sinful nature. We, dark, we were darkened to the truth. That is, we were foolish. Ignorant of spiritual understanding. Unwilling to embrace godly instruction. The writer in Proverbs, in four, Proverbs 14 and 9 says, Fools make a mock at sin. At one time, that was us. We were darkened to the truth. Undisciplined by it. Lacking understanding, unwilling to embrace it. 
You were at one time, you remember, Paul says, remember how we once were? We were disobedient to the will of God. We were resistant and rebellious. And that we were even rebellious and resistant to our own consciences. Have you ever, for example, no preacher around, no Bible in, around, but you think or you do or start to do something that something inside you says, wait a minute, that's not the thing to do. But you've done it anyhow. You've said it anyhow. You know why? That's, why, that's the way we once were. That's the way we are if we let the sinful nature control us. We're disobedient to the will of God and even resistant to our own conscience. Scripture says the fool walks in darkness. Ecclesiastes 2.14 He says, remember how we once were? We were deceived. We were deceived, wandering out of the path of truth. We were deceived. Deceived how? Well, we know that in 2 Corinthians 4 and 12, many are deceived by Satan. The God of this age, the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Deceived by Satan. Deceived by false teaching. And that false teaching isn't just false teaching that comes into the church, but we may receive false teaching from society, from our culture. Deceived by the ideas that are presented in our society that are against the teaching of the Scriptures. Deceived even by our own hearts. And perhaps this is the deepest deception of all because of Jeremiah 17 and 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. I believe the King James says, and desperately wicked, but it means beyond cure. What do you mean it's beyond cure? In other words, you can't, there's no medicine for it. You know what has to happen? You have to be given a new heart. A new spiritual heart. And that's why you need to be born again. And only the Holy Spirit, working with God's Word, can do that for us. He says, remember how we once were? We were depraved. We lived in malice. And that word malice here means morally corrupt. We were morally corrupt, enslaved by various lusts and pleasures. Do you know, we're... we're the servants of something or someone. And when, before we came to know Christ, we were morally corrupt, enslaved by various lusts and pleasures. Remember how we once were? We desired what belonged to others. We were envious, even to the point of begrudging the success of others. Well, if I can't have it, I don't want anybody to have it. That's the attitude we have. It reminds me of the first murderer. That is the first human murderer. Satan was the first. But the first human murderer, his name was what? Cain. Cain. And you know why he killed his brother? He was jealous. He was envious. You see how serious envy can be? Where it can lead us to? Even if we don't do the action, we have the inclination. Remember how we once were? We were destructive of one another, being hated and hating one another. That is, we're full of ill will toward others. Paul is trying to tell us that as we remember how we once were, we need to remember what we used to be like. So when we're dealing with other people who are that way right now, we can be sensitive. And not look down on them. Remember, he says, he didn't stop there. I'm glad of that. Remember what changed our lives? 
Remember what changed us? When the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. He saved us. In chapter 2, verse 14, it talked about redemption that came through Jesus Christ who gave Himself for us to redeem us. He saved us through the redeeming power of God. That is, He paid the debt of our sins. He, he bought us. We were redeemed through the rebirth. Jesus said, you're going to see the kingdom of God. You must be born again. John chapter 3, verses 5 and 7. You must be born again. And He saved us by the process of the rebirth. You remember as uh, He said, look, the, the heart's deceitful and it's a beyond a cure. It's got to be, you got to have a new heart. And that's what God gives us in the rebirth. And a renewal. Renewal. He saved us through renewal by the Holy Spirit. See, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. The rebirth and the renewal. God's Holy Spirit performs in us. He saved us with restoration. You know, when man fell into sin in the very garden, he really lost the dominion that he once experienced. He lost the blessedness that he once had. But you know, listen to what he says. Having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Have you read the end of the book? Yeah. How God is going to renew and restore his blessing on those who trust him. Remember, he says, the means of salvation. That means the kindness and love of God, our Savior appeared. The love of God, the Father. He mentioned the life of the Son who gave Himself for us in chapter 2, verse 14. And the lift of the Holy Spirit who brings this all to pass. And it's been generously poured out on us. Now remember the essentials of the faith. Look, faith, look at this. This is a trustworthy saying and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to what? Doing what is good. Listen, if you call yourself a Christian, if you say, yes, I'm trusting God and I'm... I'm following after Him. And yet, you aren't being careful to devote yourselves to doing what is good. Are you really following Jesus? Are you really following Him? Remember these essentials of the faith and devote yourself to doing what is good. Stress these things so that those who have trusted in God, that is, emphasize and prioritize these things so that they may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. But he goes on to say, and to avoid issues that are unprofitable and useless in living a life that glorifies God and seeks to rescue those who are perishing. I don't know if there's any letter in the Scriptures, any what we call book in the Bible, that gives us a more thorough and precise direction of how to be a healthy church than this epistle. And if we will listen to it and make an application of these directives that Paul gave to Titus to serve the various congregations on the Isle of Crete so that they could grow and be healthy churches, if we will do that, we will have a healthy church. And healthy churches continue because people 
become acquainted with the gospel through a healthy church. People meet Jesus through members of a healthy church. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we bow before you, we pray, O oh God, that we might, what, what you have provided for us here, as to how we can be a healthy church and remain a healthy church, that we might embrace these principles, these guidelines, Dear Father, we know that healthy churches require healthy individuals, healthy spiritually, healthy toward you. So Lord, help us to examine ourselves and see if there's anything of a weakness or infection in our own lives that might prevent good health in this congregation. Father, if there is, we pray for your forgiveness. We pray that you would cleanse us. Help us to walk and live for You. And Lord, if there's someone here who needs to come and say, Lord Jesus, I see what I am. But Lord, You've opened my eyes and my heart to the truth of what I can become if I will trust in You. Lord, I pray that they'll do that this very day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.